down the road, you found out I said it, I might, pro I would probably feel guilt because I know that was wrong. And I'd just feel guilt. And you'd hear it, you'd feel pain because that hurts you. But if I came to you after that and said, Mac, I am really sorry. I don't know what, what possessed me to say that. And I just had, I just asked for your forgiveness. And you say, Gary, things happen, I forgive you. You forgiving me, then I would believe that it's like it never happened. Even though it did, but you're never gonna bring it back up. We're never gonna go, we're never gonna revisit that again. Because you forgave me for that. Yeah. And we're okay. Yeah. Now we're listening to the passage this morning. Then the Lord came down, and this is in uh, Exodus, uh, what was it, 4 and 34, I think. Then the Lord came down in a cloud, and he stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness rebellion of sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And when, when the first part, he is, all that he talks about, he is just compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, faithfulness, and forgiving wickedness, wickedness, rebellion, and sin. The next part, it's almost like a P.S. in my mind. It does not leave the, leave the guilty unpunished. It does not leave the sinner unpunished, whatever. For this, for he punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Did he forgive the sins? Or is he just saying, oh, you're going to, but you know what? There, there's a price to pay. And your kids are going to pay for it. And even your grandkids are going to pay for it. Somehow that doesn't work. I, I have a hard time putting it. We all have sin in our life. And we, again, God, please forgive us. We ask for his forgiveness. Am I, am I wrong to think, well, but maybe my children will pay for the sins that, I, that I've done? Or whatever? No. But why does, it sounds like that. I can explain that. Can you understand, you understand the question? Yeah, okay. Everybody hear the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. First of all, we're, when we stand before God, we're guilty for sin. When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What he's talking about there is people stayed in their guilt because, and I'm going to talk about that. There's ten, there's ten rebellions in the book of Exodus where they didn't follow God. Okay, so if I said to you, if I said to this table here, all right, God wants to forgive your sin, he's going to wipe you all, he's going to wipe out all the sin, and not, it's all clean, I don't have to deal with it again. And you say, I accept that. But someone in the group says, well, I don't, I'm not really going to agree with that. I'm not going to go there. Then your guilt remains. We'll see that the people in Israel, this people that left the land, did that exact same thing. Some would follow and some did. Some were swallowed up by, a, we'll read that from Korah. They did, they did fully follow him. As far as the sins of your people, sin has an effect on on everybody in our family. Just like in my family, in your family, if there's sin in the family, or if someone's a, say the man's an alcoholic, and his alcoholism or his, whatever he has, has affected the rest of the family now. Because they might get abused, they might get something might happen to them. It has, sin has an effect down through the generation. But no one is held guilty for those sins. No one is held guilty. It affects them, the guilt affects them, but they're not held accountable for that. Okay? The sin affects them. Sin affects all the generations coming down through life. It affects us all. But we could then, just like with my family, maybe your family, if, if I'm a first-generation Christian and you're not, okay, you're first-generation, your family may be above you and grandparents, they didn't really love you. Now all of a sudden you come to God. So now you're forgiven, but the generations that passed under them, I want to make sure I get this, explain this right. They missed out somehow because they didn't. They were never taught. They were never <coughs> raised. They were never taken to church. They were never uh, like, okay, we're gonna go to church. You gotta hear this gospel. You gotta hear this. Those that rebelled against God were rejected Him, which would in turn follow the generations to follow. But if anyone in that generation would turn, then they could still be saved. They're not held accountable for that. 
it all still comes to an individual. I can't save my children. I'd love to. My grandchildren, I'd love to say I can't do it. They're still in their guilt. The guilt remains to every generation. But every generation is going to be free from their guilt. When, and here's what clears this up. Psalm 106, okay? When you read Psalm 106, maybe we'll get there. Today. Psalm 106 gives the whole story of what he just said. Psalm 106 is saying, you know what? Here's what happened to the children of Israel. Here's what God did with us. Man, we did this and we did this and we did this. And then at the very end of Psalm 106, I believe it says, I think it ends with amen. Someone can check me out. I, then they say, oh, okay, but God was still gracious to us. And he forgave us. I mean, remember, he was going to wipe out the whole generation. He said, Moses, I'm starting all over with you. I'm done with these people. Ten times they rebelled against him. I'm done. It's over. And Moses said, well, Lord, the Egyptians will hear this and, you know, just have compassion. Please, Lord. He begged and he made an intercession for them. Now, remember, they still paid for their sin. Listen, if, you, if you're a smoker and you smoke for 30 years, will God forgive you for that? Absolutely. But it doesn't mean you're not going to have emphysema or some type of something from that. There's still a payment for sin that's, that's the result of sin, but not the sin itself. Okay, so you're forgiven for your sin. If everybody, if you confess your sins, God will forgive you of every <coughs> sin you've committed, every one. But it doesn't mean that there's still not going to be effects of that sin. Like if, if a parent is through the divorce, could God forgive them and, and broke up the family and the kids are completely wiped out from this and hurt by this? That could all be forgiven, but the effects are still there. And now I have to deal with that. So the effects of the children of Israel, their sin affected the generations to follow. But it doesn't mean that they can't be saved from that. Is that helpful? Okay, see, we're all sinners. We're all, we all sin. Okay, and I can confess my sin. And, and what happens is, here's what happens. This is why Hebrews says, don't let a root of bitterness enter your heart. Because you could, be, you could forgive someone, but you're not going to forget. And you're always going to hold that against it. So whenever a person talks about that person with you, you still have that in your mind. Yeah, I don't know what they did to me. But then you haven't really forgiven them. No, you haven't. Right. You have to let that go. And that's why the Lord says this. And, and you can't, people try to spin this. Here's what it says when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you forgive men their trespasses and sins, I will forgive you of yours. But if you don't forgive them of them, neither will I forgive you of yours. Forgiveness is a very serious thing. You have to forgive. We have to forgive. And if, and if you have trouble forgiving, just turn it around and just look what God has forgiven you of. When you put it in perspective, if you could recognize that God has forgiven you of everything, every thought, every action, every disobedience, and you look at man, Lord, you forgave me. And that's why the Lord gave a, a parable of this. He said, listen, this one guy owed so much, and another one owed just a little bit, and he forgave this big debt. Remember the story? And the guy wouldn't remember, even forgive that little bit. And he says, you're out. You're, you're cursed. If you can't forgive. Forgiveness is a part of Christianity. Forgiveness is, is what cleanses us. Forgiveness is, you've got to forgive. Now, as far as forgetting, you might not... It's always going to be in your mind, okay? You can't get that out of your mind. But you have to be willing not to bring it up again like you said. So if Christine, if I did something against Christine and she's really forgiven me, and I hurt her, but she's forgiven me, she, she can't bring that up again. So yeah, Mac, I remember a year ago you did that. And I remember this happened before. And this happened to me. What if God did that to us? <laughs> What if God said, yeah, I, did, I know what you did last week. I know what you did before that. I know you thought that. I know you did that. I saw everything you did. And if he says your sins and iniquities, I remember you no more, then what should we do? We have to look at it from God's perspective and not just ours. And that's why Romans, Romans 4 says, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm gonna get, i got to get saved. i got to repent because if I know God's going to do this for me. The Bible says... The goodness of God leads us to repentance. When you see how good God has been to you, and how gracious He's been to you, and how undeserving He's been, you can't help but say, Lord, I repent. You've been so good to me. Who am I to think that I'm treating this person like that? 
So my kids are not accountable to my sins, but my sins affect my kids. Okay? All right, good question. Excellent. I like it. Any other question? Not lead to a question. Okay. Folks, what we're doing in this class, and you got to pray for me because I struggle. Here's what I struggle with. Okay. When, I was a, when I was a pastor, you, know, you guys know I was a pastor for over 30 years. I used to be in my office and study. And as I was studying, I couldn't believe I was getting paid for studying the Bible. And so I would get up, and I, the Lord would give me so much information. And I'd get out, I'd leave, I'd leave my office and walk around the sanctuary, and I'd go, I can't take anymore. I can't. How do I, how do I deliver this? It's too much. I can't. And I had to walk away from it because there was just too much information. And as I come to this class, I'm trying to teach an overview of the Bible, and I'm thinking, Lord, there's too much information. How many trails do I take them down? Where do I, where do I go with this? To my trails. And so what I'm trying to do here is I'm gonna, and that's why I put up a bigger one. Remember I just put the GNR? Okay? Here's what, here's what my plan is now. And I hope you can be patient with me. If there's questions, study on your own, or if there's questions, ask. But what we're gonna do, since we're still in Exodus, and I'm gonna get out of Exodus, I'm gonna get through Leviticus and into Numbers today. <laughs> we're gonna go like this. Bam, like, okay, what's the main thing? What's the main thing? And what does God want to show us? And then why well, I put this up longer, I think this was Augustine wrote this and said by different men. <laughs> the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. So as we study the Old Testament, it's going to be revealed in the New Testament. And that's pretty clear. That's like when, I, when we see something over here, whether it's a type or something, we can look over here in the New Testament and say, let me put a divine line here, New Testament, with math. <clears throat> we can look from here to here and say, oh, this is why this, they did this here. What the uh, children of Israel did physically, and just like God blessed them physically when they're obedient, God blesses us spiritually when we're obedient. Now the Spirit of God indwells in us. That's why when you look at the book of Joshua, you can't read Joshua without Ephesians. The Old Testament Joshua, Joshua is the New Testament Ephesians. It begins in Joshua 1.3 when he talks about, I'm going to bless you wherever you go, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless you. When you read uh, Ephesians 1.3, I've already blessed you with all spiritual blessings in my place. I give you a real blessing. They're already there. We have to know as believers that all of our blessings, every blessing you're ever going to get is already here. We just have to tap into it. It's like having a billion dollars and never spending any of it. Spending anything of it. We have already been blessed. That's past tense. All spiritual blessings are ours. Every one is already ours. We just need to know, well, how do I tap into that? It's like living on the street, but you have billions of dollars in the bank. God wants us to see that. That's Joshua and Ephesians. If you want to understand Leviticus, you must study Hebrews. You can't go without them. So if I was going to draw the line to make these meet, okay, it's revealed here, it's revealed here. As we're going through this, remember the book of Genesis is the beginning, the beginning of everything. The beginning of man, wife, husband, wife, of Abraham, nations, languages. Everything's in Genesis. You get the Exodus now. God says because of the sins, the constant sins of mankind, how to bring a flood, how to destroy mankind because of his sin, how to deal with given languages, have them scatter because of their sin. Now I'm going to have one hub, I'm going to have one place of worship, one place where everybody's going to have to come to me. And I'm going to call that the promised land. And it's going to be called Jerusalem. And in the very end, there's going to be a new Jerusalem and everybody's going to come and worship me there. That's the Bible. And so Exodus now is saying, okay, it's time to leave Egypt, which is a type of the world, bondage. I'm in bondage to the world, just like when you got saved, you were in bondage to the world. I'm going to leave the world, and I'm going to exit the world, and I'm going to go serve the Lord. So now I'm in Exodus. God says, okay, you want to serve me? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you commandments to follow. And I want you to keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So here's what I want you to do. Well, mankind's going to fail miserably. But because God delivered them from the bondage of Egypt, they became so thankful at first. They were thankful at first. I mean, they're going to sin. They're going to rebel, just like we do. We're thankful for our salvation, but we rebel in our salvation, right? 
Everybody here, you look at, if you look at uh, one rebellious guy, and I'm looking at about 30 more rebellious people, and I'll show you why, why we rebel against God. So, in the book of Exodus, we're exiting the world, and now we're saying, okay, I'm going to destroy the gods. You remember I talked about this last week. I'm going to destroy the ten gods of Egypt that you were following for 400 years. These four, and he mentioned that this morning. Did anybody pick up on that? Did I say that last week? He mentioned the ten gods, you know, the gods that you followed for all these years. You're so used to following this and eating that and doing that, and now you're taken out from that. So, in the book of Exodus, God promises them the, the, the promised land. In there, he's going to tell them what they need to do about their sin. And, they, and he said this, God says, I'm going to dwell with you. And I want you to build a tabernacle. And so from Exodus 25 to 40 is all about the tabernacle because God's going to live. And he even says, here's how I want all the children of Israel to live around them. And he tells each um, tribe, each son of Israel, how they're supposed to who's going to be in the north camp, south camp, west camp, east camp, with the Levites in the center that they're going to worship. They're not supposed to be counted because they're Levites. They're going to serve as priests. So when we go from Exodus, we go into Leviticus, and now guess what? He's saying, okay, if you're going to be a follower of me and you're going to lead the world, here's what I want you to do. This is how I want you to worship me. So when you read the book of Leviticus, which might, which might be very boring to some of you, it is full of so much truth. Because when you begin the book of Leviticus, you're now going to read about the offerings. Free will offerings. As a believer, we freely say, Lord, I love you. Here I am. I want to serve you. How can I serve you? The book of Leviticus is, is showing the offerings. Do this as free will offerings. Then he says this. He says in Leviticus, not only that, you love me so much, I want you to have feast toward me. And those feasts <coughs> will honor me. So guess what? In the book of Leviticus, you read about seven feasts. Seven feasts to honor the Lord. The one was the Passover. There was the Day of Atonement, which we just did today. We're still remembering the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So what are we told to do? Church, when you gather together, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Remember the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Remember his blood shed for you. We just did that. So we're still continuing from, we're still doing that all the way over here where we are in life. Still doing it. It's a wonderful thing that we now, okay, we, we understand the blood. So with Leviticus, he says, okay, if you love me, here's your burnt offering, here's what you do. You can get rid of your guilt. There's guilt offerings. There's free will offerings. And so he says, if you love me, just serve me. And enjoy me. And honor me. Because I'm coming back. And all of those seven feasts have to do with the New Testament. Jesus fulfills all of them. He fulfills all seven feasts. In fact, we're waiting for the trumpets, right? If you read, now if I'm going to eschatology, which I'd be way down another road if I did that. So if we talked about the, 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 the uh, fall feast of how many people think Jesus is coming on these days because of the trumpets and so on, the gathering and so on. I mean, that would take a whole nother, uh, that would just take me down any rabbit trails. But the feasts were there for us to show us to worship God, to be a part of Him. Jesus honored the feast. When He was here, He went to Jerusalem during the feast times, and He honored them. When you get to the book of Numbers, okay, so Genesis is our beginning, Exodus, I'm leaving the world, Leviticus, I'm worshiping God. Numbers is now, how am I going to walk with God? How am I going to be obedient to God in my walk every day? That's the book of Numbers. And so Numbers then tells us, all right, uh, first of all, in the book of Numbers, let me do this. Genesis is thousands of years. I did this before. Exodus is 80 years. If you go from the time Moses was born and to the time he let Israel out, he was 80 years old when he let him out. Exodus, the book of Exodus is one month, just one month. So when you read the book of Exodus, that took, I meant, I'm sorry, Leviticus, that's one month. So let me make sure I'm clear since this is on tape. Genesis is book of beginnings up until, and I gave you this out before, this little piece of paper. Okay? And then there's 400 silent years. And then we have Exodus here. It's 1500 B.C. with Moses and what was written. And so then we have the Exodus, the going out, which was 80 years. 
Forget about him. 120 when he died. 40 years in Egypt. 40 years in the desert. God sends him back to lead the people for 40 years in the wilderness. So the book of Numbers is, well, by the time, there's a little time between that. The book of Numbers is about 38 years to be exact. Some will say 40. It's 38 years. It even says that in Scripture. These 38 years. It'll, show, it'll say that, 38 years. So during those 38 years, the Lord is trying to show us how we're supposed to walk with Him. When you get to Deuteronomy, it's the second law. That's what it means, second law. Now He's saying, listen, people. When you follow me, if you're really going to leave Egypt, and you're going to worship me, and you're going to walk with me, now I want to make absolutely clear that you make the choice. When you... When you get to Deuteronomy, he first of all gives the Shema. He says, listen, when you sit down, when you stand up, when you walk in the way, you teach these things to your children. You better stay in God's word and you teach these. All the time teach them. And don't ever forget what I do to you. When you get to Deuteronomy 30, he says, listen, you got to choose. I'm going to make a way between life and death. Here it is. Here's the choices. Between life and death. You get to choose, but here's what I'm looking for for your obedience. Jesus then, shoot ahead here, Jesus now is going to start his ministry. What does happen? Satan comes along. Where does he quote from? Deuteronomy. What does he say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do not tempt the Lord thy God. That's Deuteronomy. That's the Pentateuch. And then when you get to the only other writings of, of uh, Moses, he wrote Psalm 90. And in that, he says, listen, he says, the days of your life the days of your life are only 70 years. And if by grace you live to be 80, that's what it says, right, in Psalm 90. And then he's, well, why would he say that? Well, when they started in the walk, it says, uh, God told them, he says, in Numbers, that's why it's called Numbers here, we call them, because it's numbered the people. They numbered the people. And when they numbered it in, in uh, Numbers, it says, okay, number the people, and just the ones over 20 of fighting age. This is why there was millions of people left, probably two and a half million left Israel. There was 603,550 fighting men from the tribes of Israel, and they're all mentioned. You can just add the numbers up. It's mentioned right there in the scripture. It says it. I'm not saying anything that the Bible doesn't say. Right there it says it. 38 years later, 38 years later, there's 601,000. They lost a couple thousand. Now, God's blessing to them was showing their multiply. Why was there no addition? Why? You'd think there'd be way more, right? What happened? They were in rebellion. They didn't listen to the Lord. So what did he do? Everyone over the age of 20, they all died. Except for Caleb and Joshua. Every one of them. So if you were 21, you didn't live to be 62. You died. Everybody died over the age of 20. Because, because of their disobedience. You see, there's a result of sin. It doesn't mean you can't be forgiven of sin, but there's still a result from sin. So, God, so at the very end, now there's only 601,000. And when you read, if you do a deeper study, and this is where I don't like to get down all these rabbit trails, I read all the, from the tribes, how many from each of the tribes? And when you look at it, <clears throat> when you look at the tribes, it looks like... Um, Let me see how I can do this. It looks like this. Okay. Tabernacles in the middle. The tribes of Judah and so on on the east, west, has all these tribes named. Who was there? Who was here? Who was here? What does that look like to you? A cross. A cross. Who's in the center? God. God. God then, in the center of that, is, this is how the tabernacle was built. And everybody had to go. But there was numbers given. And as you read the numbers of these tribes, some numbers were more than other numbers. When you get to the end, some of the tribes lost like seven or eight thousand. They were way down. And when you say, well, why were they way down? Way down. Why was this tribe have less and this tribe has a couple more? Like Asher, I think, was blessed with a couple more. And Simeon, where Dan, lost more. They lost it from their senses. And that's because of sin in the camp. That's because of how God dealt with sin. So, throughout this whole 38 years of walking in the wilderness, they lost people. And so, when Moses wrote Psalm 90, 
what did he say then? After he said, okay, you're not only going to be 70 or 80, if by God's grace you'll live to be 80, then he says this, I think it's Psalm 90, verse 11 and 12. Am I, did you pull that up? Psalm 90. I think he said in verse 12 or so, uh, Psalm 90, yeah. Get down to verse 12, I think. Okay. Yeah, right here it is. So he knows, so, so they knew, go oh, back down a little bit, let me go back down to verse 9, 8, I mean, 8, 8, down there somewhere. Look what he says here. Uh, you have set our iniquities before you, and our secret sins in light of your countenance. The children of Israel were so full of sin, they were so rebellious, complaining about everything. Complain, 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 complain. You know, you know why, folks, God doesn't like complaining. You know, Philippians 2.14, you know, Philippians 2.14 says, this is what it says, do everything without murmuring or complaining. What does he say before that? He says, let me tell you what God did. He became a servant. And if you become a servant, and you feel you're taken advantage of because you're a servant, and we complain because I feel like I'm a servant, you're treating me like a servant. He's feeling the same with God as a servant. And even though you might think that you're only serving, you should be thankful because God is one who came to serve, not to be served. So you're more like Christ, and if your attitude is right there, then you're going to be able to do things without murmuring or complaining. That's why Philippians 2.14 says, do everything, everything, without <coughs> or complaining. Can you imagine how much life would be better if we didn't complain so much? Wouldn't it? Absolutely. And guess what? You're looking at a complainer, I'm looking at a complainer. <laughs> <clears throat> We're always complaining about something. Oh, this is well, I can't believe this happened now. I'm just, uh, These first world problems kill us. We complain. Oh, the cable's out. Did anybody know that? Did your electric go off? I've been on for two hours now. Come to the mission field where there's no electric. I've been in Haiti where it's a candle. I gave them all little flashlights, and they were just so happy walking in the dark in Haiti. I, I, I brought to hunt like 300 flashlights that big. You know, those kinds you push in, you know? They were so, you should have seen them, all with these flashlights. Because they just had, didn't have any flashlights. Not in northern Haiti, there's no electricity. But we, in our little world, we like to complain. And so Moses saying, listen, these people, <clears throat> to God, complain, where's the meat? Where's this? We don't have this. We, we miss our onions. We miss our leeks. <laughs> he says, our secret sins in light of your countenance, for all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finished our years with a sigh. Man, we just, this is, the, now remember, this is Moses speaking, and he saw everyone die in the wilderness over the age of 20, except for Caleb and Joshua, and he himself is going to die because of his rebellion. Even Moses you know what that tells me? No one's exempt. No one is exempt. If God told Moses, and Moses argued with God, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but when God says, okay, Moses, you're not going to the promised land either because of what you did there, you're not going to go. And Moses simply said, oh, Lord, please, let me go. I want to go. I want to see the promised land. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, Moses, don't talk about this again. You're not going in. I'm going to let you look at it. I'll let you see the land but you're not going in. And so what I want you to do, as your last job for me, is I want you to raise up a leader that's going to lead them in. And his name is Joshua, which means Jehovah saves. It all makes sense. See, I've told you guys many times that I teach here, everything makes so much sense. It's absolutely, it's perfect. The Bible's perfect. Everything it says, everything, it, there's, there's a reason behind all of it. And when you compare it and see it all from, from like above, and we're trying to look at the, the Genesis of Revelation from up here, and just following it from Genesis, Exodus, up and it, yeah, I see it. The Psalms, even Moses wrote that. Yeah, I can see. Psalm 106 is all about that. I, I already quoted, I think it's Psalm 106. Quotes all this stuff. So, with that, here's, we're gonna, here's how we're going to bounce through Exodus, if you would. Any questions? Does that bring any thoughts? Questions? Does it make sense to you? Yes. Okay, thanks. I heard that. <laughs> All right. So in the book of Exodus, as we're leaving the world, we're exiting out of the world, God says this. He shows us the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb is the one that's going to deliver you. And it has to be a lamb without any problem, any defect. 
It's going to be there. And you present it, and what you need to do if you want to be delivered is you have to apply the blood. If the blood isn't applied, then the death angel will take you out. You have to apply the blood. And so, when we read, oh, Carl, if you have that 1 Corinthians 5, 7, here's what the Lord said. I just, want to, I just want to now bring this over to here. Everything I'm going to bring over here, from here to here, if this was revealed, if this was concealed, now it's revealed, in the, the Old Testament is revealed in the New, we want to do that in our weeks ahead of study. So in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, to purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. This is sin. Leaven's always a type of sin in the Bible. Okay? Since you are truly unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. So Christ became the Passover lamb. And that's what he did for us. So in John 1, 29, look what he says here. Jesus is starting his ministry. And he's, he, he came into his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God. That's John 1, 11, 12. But in John 1, uh, yeah, 29, look what it says here. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and what did he say? Everybody who would sacrifice lambs all would know exactly what this is. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Unbelievable. All the way back to Exodus. You've got to apply the blood. You've got to present the lamb. Uh, priest, high priest, you've got to go in to the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. You've got to go in and present the blood. When I see the blood, I'll forgive your sin. Jesus is the final sacrifice. When that veil was ripped in two, no more going to temples, no more of that. The Lamb of God has already completed all of that for us. Done. It's a done deal. So when we read about all these sacrifices, everything in the Old Testament... Jesus said, that's me. I'm the Lamb of God. And what do I do? I'm going to take away the sin of the whole world that whoever trusts in me, whoever believes in me, should not perish but have everlasting life. I have covered all mankind's sin. I am the scapegoat. And the scapegoat, remember, we use that today. If you're a scapegoat, that means you're fighting fault. You're taking the faults of other people. Jesus became our scapegoat. He died and then sent that thing in to remember our sins no more. The scapegoat was left outside. You go. He took all the sin. It's gone forever. As far as the east is from the west. Jesus did all that for us. This is why the more you study the Bible, the more you appreciate what God has done for us, and the more you can recognize what Romans says, the goodness of God leads me to repentance. The goodness, Lord, you, you're so good. If only I can only see, you know, some of our children, not we all, most of you have had children or whatever. I don't think our kids realize just all the sacrifices that we sometimes do for them. We just take it for granted. Whether it's getting them to school or packing their lunches and taking care of them, making sure they get their medical needs, you do all that for all those years, and maybe once in a while a kid might become a little thankful for that. Think about what God did for us. And sometimes we just got to step back and say, man, Lord, I don't even think about all that you did when you died on the cross. I don't even think about not just the forgiveness of sin, but just the blessing of my, everything you've ever done for me, you, the breath, everything you created for me to enjoy. It's all of you. And I just need to step back and say, I, the one in the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Wait a minute. In everything give thanks. I got it. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He has a plan. He has something he wants to show you or teach you or to guide you in. And if only we could be thankful for where we are in life or what's going on. It's not, and our idolatry becomes covetousness when we want what someone else has. I don't have what they have. I wish I had what they had more than me. They could do these or do these things, and I can't do those. I could never go on vacation. I could never do that. And then all of a sudden, guess what we find ourselves doing? Complaining. Murmuring and complaining, because we're good at that. Go to Revelation 5, Carl, if you would please. The ones I highlighted there. So, here's the Lamb of God. In, in the book of Revelation, the rapture had already take, has taken place. That's Revelation 4.1. I believe it takes place before 1. We're now in heaven. We're worshiping the Lord. The Lord now has the title deed of the earth. 
the title deed of the earth is what's going to get everything back to him. Satan wants to control it. God says, I'm going to, you know what, in the book of Revelation, I'm going to take care of sin. I'm going to take care of all the sinners. I'm going to take care of Satan. I'm going to take care of the demons. I'm going to take away those. Never going to, again, going to be death, crying, sorrow, pain, ever. I'm going to deal with that. And so, as John saw this, he's, he's, there was a scroll written inside, the title deed of the earth, sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to open up the scroll and loose its seals? Is there anyone worthy? Is there anyone in heaven or on the earth or under the earth to able to open the scroll? And John's, this is in the Greek, as he's weeping and weeping and crying and weeping because no one was found worthy to open up and read the scroll or even look at it. And I think I mentioned this before. Can you imagine? <clears throat> can Moses do it? Can Abraham do it? David, you could do it. You could, Paul, Peter, so, well, certainly one of you could do it. You can't do it. There's no one not under the earth, nowhere. But then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood what? A lamb. All the way back to Exodus. I looked as a lamb as though it had been slain. He's taken us all the way back here when he said, you want to be delivered from Egypt? Do you want to be delivered? Do you want to have eternal life? Do you want to get to the promised land? Make sure you kill that lamb and you apply that blood. Behold the lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Then Revelation, here's the one who's going to open up the title deed. Then the seal judgments are open. Bang, bang, bang. Seven seals. Seven trumpets. Seven bowl judgments. God is carrying out his will to, to bring Israel to himself and to judge all the Gentile nations. That's the book of Revelation. And it's all done by the lamb. So when John said, and John, remember John, who wrote John, also wrote this. I can't imagine what was in his head when, he, way back three and a half years before, well, way back, this is 50 years before, 60 years before, Revelation was written in 94, 95 AD. John was written right after Jesus died in 30 AD. So it's in there, so. Anyway, he wrote, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And then he wrote this, 50 years later, oh, the Lamb of God is coming. John, who laid on Jesus' breast and called Beloved, is now in Revelation, fell down as a dead man in Revelation 1 because he sees Jesus in his risen and glorified state. Because the Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus Christ, and John now sees him in all his glory, and not just in a manger, not just on a cross, not just walking. He sees Christ in all his glory, and he falls down as dead. That's how wonderful this picture scene is. And so, as we study these books, I want you to consider and think as we go through all these, and even though we're just going to hop, skip, and jump across it, everything leads to here. Everything. That's like the great, this, that is why I taught in Revelation 11 times. There's no greater book. I do it backwards then. I teach the book of Revelation and come backwards and show all this, how it happens. There's no better book that, because it's Christ in all his glory. It's Christ the way he should be. He always was. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. And he's always been king. He told Israel, you don't need a king. I am your king. When he came in a manger, he says, I am the king of the Jews. Herod said he knew the king. i got to kill this king. So everybody tried to kill him. Everybody's always been trying to kill him. Everybody's been always trying to kill the land of Israel and take it away. Right now, from the river to the sea... Let's get rid of them. Hitler, you got to get rid of them. Everybody wants to get rid of them. You can't do it. You can't do it. It's not going to happen. God's already declared, listen, all Israel is going to be saved one day. Romans 11, 30 something. <laughs> all Israel will be saved. So, anyway. So God, here's what, so, so let's go to the book of Exodus now. I'll try to bounce us through this. So in the book of Exodus... We, we recognize in Exodus 17, there's going to be fights as we're walking out of the world, into the out of the world, and start serving God. Okay. In Exodus 17, we know they're going to have a fight out of Amalek. And I can just tell you the story. You know the story. Amalek is a type of the flesh in the Bible. Amalek is always going to attack Israel, always attacking Israel, always attacking God's people, which is a type of the flesh. The flesh wants to rule your heart. There's always a battle going on between us. Right here, always a battle. Flesh. Spirit. The spirit wants to take control of our life. Now the spirit's in there, 
but the spirit wants to have full control, but the flesh also wants to have culture, full control. It's it's fuke, it's suke versus soma is the Greek word. Suke versus soma. Spirit, flesh. Spirit, flesh. Who's going to win the battle? Constantly going on. And so, in the uh, oh, so in there as they're uh, fighting the Amalekites, what happens? The Amalekites will be winning when Moses stops praying. His hands fall down. So here comes her and. Um, No, who we'll have to hold his other hand? Um, anyway, they come in and hold his arms up, and he starts with Joshua starts waiting for yeah. that. Someone say it? Okay. Aaron. Aaron, of course. Aaron and her. Yeah, Aaron and her. You guys saw the movie Ben Hur and so on. They make all these movies and stuff like that. This is hey, I love when I watch like either the Ten Commandments or any of these Bible movies. I said no, no. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, that's good. no, no. <laughs> so anyway, there's some of them. They got the gist of it, but I go, where did they get that? <laughs> that's not in there, but just to make it a little bit more. And maybe that's too much thinking on my part. Cause said, don't don't ruin it for me, right? No, but that's not accurate. <laughs> that didn't really happen like that. And so anyway, so anyway, we know in order to battle the lesson there is if I'm going to battle the flesh, it's only won by prayer. If I'm not praying, no wonder I'm defeated. If I'm praying, you win the battle. So you got to be in prayer. And that's the part of it. Okay, so let's go to the commandments. Exodus chapter 20. Here's the Ten Commandments. I, I know you guys know these, but I want to just say a few words about them because if I'm going to teach the book Exodus, how do I just skip over the Ten Commandments? Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, as he begins... Uh, Let's just start at verse, well, we'll start, and God spoke, okay, so we know this is coming from God, this is verse 1, and God spoke all these things, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, okay, so I'm out of Egypt, I was in bondage in the world, I brought you out, therefore, you shall have no other gods before me, that's the first thing he says, don't put other gods before me, we know he just destroyed the ten gods of Egypt, so don't you do it, don't put any other gods before me. And we know the mistake they made. They're going to, when Moses comes down from the stump, as we read this morning, they're going to rise up and play and build a calf. And that's why God was fed up with these people. They just don't stop. They don't stop sinning. When is it going to stop? And remember, there is a time when God should take us home. There is a time when God will take a believer home because of sin. It doesn't mean you're going to hell. It means that he doesn't want you to live a life that's going to continue in sin that you cause his name to be blasphemed because of the life you're living. There is a sin unto death. I do not say you should pray for it. There comes a time when God says that's enough. And that's a righteous judgment. And we should all prefer that. Lord, if I'm going to lead your life down a dirty path, then take me home first. I don't want to cause your name to be blasphemed through my life. I want the people around me to be saved to see Christ living in me. Not cursing Christ because of the life I'm living. And so we have the first commandment. No other gods and going to need to feed ten false gods. Then he says, uh, verse 4, You shall not make yourself any carved images. We looked at that today. What does he say? He said 300 million or 3 million? Go to worship Mary or something in Mexico? He says, don't do it. Don't bring these uh, carved images to me. I don't, want to, I don't want to see any of that. We were supposed to bow down to God only. And then in verse 7, you shall not take the Lord the God in vain. Don't take his name in vain. In fact, I remember doing this a couple times, but oh, this guy was taken up. Uh, let, me, let me confess something to you here. This is, this is, I'm a Christian for about a year. I was at Lisa's Candy Company for the first of the year. And my supervisor didn't like the way something I did or something I was doing or whatever. And he come over and starts going, JC, GD, GD, right in my face, right here. I grabbed him and I pinned him against the wall and said, You say that one more time, you're on the ground. So I did. I'm a Christian. I said, You're. He goes, Whoa. And he's back like this. I said, Don't you ever take the Lord's name in vain like that. Now remember, I'm, I'm only 20 years old. Okay? I'm 20 years old. And he. He uh, shook that off, and uh, he said, uh, 
Um, he said, well, let's go to the office. I says, okay, let's go to the office. Went to the office. I said, you know, this guy's been cursed. You're not allowed to curse anybody out. Not allowed to swear at anybody at Reese's Candy Company. He, um, I said, he's been cursing me out. He's been doing this and saying this. He got reprimanded. I did. Even though I put my back then, you could put hands on people a little easier than they can today. And so uh, that was the end of it. And there might be another time or so where I said, you know, brother, or just a friend, God will not hold you guiltless to take his name in vain. What does it do to you when you hear someone say, ask God to damn something or take Jesus' name in it? What does that do in your heart? If that doesn't do something, I mean, there's something about, okay, use all those other slang words that are swear words. I can, I can put up with anything from F to you name. I can put up with that. But you take the Lord's name in vain, that's a whole different animal now. That's completely different. And that's what the Lord said. Look what he says. He says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who take his name in vain. <clears throat> You're asking God to curse him? You're using God as a curse word? Why don't you use your own mother? I never use my mother. I love her. Well, then what are you saying about God? Why don't you use some other name? But we take God's name and use it in vain. God says, no. That can never happen with you. Okay, so then the next one. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day. Why don't we keep the Sabbath today? Should we answer that one? Why don't we keep the Sabbath today? Because we're not under the law. Huh? Because we're not under the law. You remember I wrote this last week? Is there, was, it ten, was there ten commandments? How many laws were there? Six hundred and thirteen. Six thirteen. I grew up at six thirteen Carver Street, Pottsville. That's where I was born. <laughs> Remember that? Six six hundred six thirteen. Six hundred thirteen laws. That's counting the ten. So there's six hundred three plus the ten commandments. Here's how we know. There's a few ways why we know. First of all, did the Lord break the Sabbath when He was on the earth? Last did He? Yes, quite a few times. Did, did Jesus ever sin? Of course not. He said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. So he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. When the Gentiles starting to become saved, believers, they had a meeting, Acts chapter 15. Should we hold them to all of our laws? No, we can't put that burden on them. They shouldn't do anything. They abstain from blood, abstain from immorality. Here's what they need. You can read about Acts chapter 15. But then Jesus said in Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 2, 21, here's what he said. Jesus speaking. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the Lord was saying, you know what, man? You guys need to chill out one day. You need to just rest. Made for you. And he said, well, who would you if, you felt, if your cow fell in the bread or the hole, which is on the Sabbath? Remember, you couldn't work more than 200... You couldn't walk a quarter mile on the Sabbath. Otherwise you sinned. So if someone was, if your neighbor or one of your family members just down the street a half mile was really sick and needed your help, you couldn't go. Not the Sabbath. It's a Sabbath. And so the Lord says, listen, you wouldn't misunderstand the Sabbath. This was made, the Sabbath was made for man, not for man, for the Sabbath. That's why when you get to Romans chapter 14, I, I mentioned this before, if you would, Romans chapter 14 are the gray areas. Like if you want to know, well, is it, is it more Christian to have a red car or a blue car? Should I go to church on Sunday because it's the first day of the week or can I worship God on a Wednesday? What can I do? See, we have our own thinking of what it should be when the Bible says, hang on a minute. So when you get to Romans 14, he says, uh, yeah, Romans 14, I'm sorry. I thought I said that. Romans 14, I'll start at verse 5. Romans 14, verse 5. Look what he says here. One person esteems one day above another. Oh, it's Saturday. It has to be Saturday. If you don't worship Saturday, no. Saturday. Another esteems every day alike. Wait a minute. I'm supposed to be holy every day, isn't it? See, that's why the Lord gave the Sermon on the Mount. He says, it has been said, but I say unto you. If you say you shouldn't commit adultery, but I'm telling you, if you look on a woman who lust after her, you already did it in your heart. He takes it a way step further. You, you see, one day above it, like, okay, but let each be fully persuaded in his own mind. It comes to where your heart is. 
Lord, when I am, I'm work, so I'm going to worship you on Saturday. I'm going to worship you on this day. It says, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks. And he does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, he gives thanks. He gives God thanks, for none of us lives life to himself, and no one dies to himself. So, if who's, who's Hunter's in here? Hunter? Okay. If you came and say you got your fifth deer, and you're only allowed one or two, you're allowed dough or whatever you're allowed, and you say, Matt, come on over. Eric says, Matt, come on over for dinner. And he's, I said, don't be happy. i got some good things. And then I said, yeah, I'll come over. And then if he says, well, you know what? This is my fifth deer. I wasn't supposed to. This is my fifth deer. I'm supposed to say, well, Eric, I can't eat that then because you took that illegal. Now, if he doesn't say anything to me, and he says, this is Mac, have some deer meat. It's really good for you. Good health, protein. I'm supposed to eat, not even think about it. I don't have to, I'm not accountable for that. If meat was offered to an idol, and you don't say, look, I got this meat, I think I mentioned this before. If you buy meat for $5 a pound, or five cents a pound, but it's really $5 a pound, but because it was already offered to an idol, you can get it for five cents a pound. Guess what? I'm buying the five cents a pound meat because to me, there is no such thing as an idol. But to someone else, that might offend them, so if that offends them, I'm not going to eat that meat. So there's gray areas that you have to be fully persuaded in your own mind. And the Bible says anything that's not of faith is sin. Now, when I say that, that means one person could sin and another person will not sin over the same thing. Because your conscience is telling you what you were taught to do and you're going against your own conscience. So it's like if my, if my parents said, Mac, after school, you've got to come right home. And another parent says to this kid, after school, you can play for an hour before you come home. Who's right? They both are the parents. There's being obedient to their parent. I've got to go home. You can stay. And so it comes down to when God says, are you going to be obedient to me? Because this is the gray area. But you've got to make sure you're not offending your brother in doing so. It says, listen, if you... He who gives thanks and he does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat. I'm not going to give it because I have a guilty conscience about this. Huh? And God gives thanks for none of us live to himself or die to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So what's the Lord saying to you? Some of you, again, you have to see your own conscience. Have to determine, is, is a Christmas tree okay? Or should I not have a Christmas tree okay? Is it, where's my conscience in that? We know if you go back into Isaiah and so on, it talks about the tree as being a place of sin. I'm not going to go there now. But you know what I'm saying. There's a time when you have to decide that a man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And so as we come to these commandments, okay, he's saying to us, you know what? Um, uh, remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. That was for them. Next, what next commandment? Verse 12. Honor thy father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Now, throughout the Bible, uh, New Testament, Jesus, there, honor the Lord, honor your father and mother, honor your father and mother, honor your father and mother. We're supposed to honor that. We're supposed to continue to honor that. Carl, could you pull Ephesians up? I think I gave you Ephesians. Uh, what did I give you that? One of Ephesians. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. Look what it says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. The Lord says in Timothy and he says in Romans, he says, in the last days, let me tell you what's going to happen. Kids are going to become disobedient to parents. You mark this down. You're going to see kids. This is Romans 1 and um, 1 Timothy 3 or 4. You're going to see the disobedience of kids. To parents. You're going to see it. He's saying, honor your, this is the New Testament now. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What's the promise? That, you're, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Honor your father and mother. What does it say in, back in Exodus? Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. That was um, 2 Timothy, was 3 2, if you were wondering that other verse. 2 Timothy, you don't have to go there, Carl. 2 Timothy 3 2 was the other one. Next commandment, uh, verse 13 Thou shalt not murder. Guess how many murders there were there were in 2022 in the United States alone? 21,156 murders. 800 murders a day in our country. 
of 800 murders a day throughout our country. 21,156. Abortions. Since Roe versus Wade, this is, this is 2022, 63 million. Right now, aborting over 620,000 per year. That's 700 babies per day killed by abortion. Babies, 700 babies a day are killed by abortion. Worldwide, 41 million abortions a day in our world today. 41 million a day. God says, don't murder. You don't, don't murder. And, it's, and we're murdering. Next one, verse 14, uh, Exodus 20, 14. You should not commit adultery. 20 to 25 percent of men commit adultery. 10 to 50 percent of women. Over 50 million people were involved in adultery this year in the United States. That's whether you're a single one, married, going to a married man, or a married man, or a woman, or a married woman, or a man. 50 million adultery. That's that's I can't grasp that. How many people cheat on their mates? And these aren't my statistics. These are the ones I just read. The next one: You shall not steal. Stealing, 13 billion in retail theft last year. 13 billion in retail theft. That's not counting any type of stealing from your company, stealing cars, stealing phones, stealing from your income tax. That's not. That's only counting retail theft. Carl, go to Revelation 9. Look what it says here. During the tribulation, as people are living in life, just you guys, isn't it horrible? Look when we were kids. Now you can run in the store, they, they take what they want and run out. And they won't even do anything about it. I'm not going to follow that up. It was only, you know, $50 or $200 worth of groceries. I'm not going to. In, in Revelation chapter 9, start 21. Okay. Well, I'm going to start at verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. They're not going to repent. In Revelation, they're not going to repent. They should, that they should worship demons and idols of gold, silver. They, want, they just want their things, you know, money, houses, whatever they own, wood, anything they have built. That's what they worship. Which neither see nor hear. And they did not repent. Notice, they did not repent of their murders, all the abortions, all the killing. The, the stats I just gave you, they're not going to repent of that. They're not going to repent of sorceries. That word is the Greek word pharmakia, which means drugs. That's what the word sorcery means here. <coughs> Pharmakia, who we got our word pharmacy from. Uh, or sexual immorality. I'm not, you know, sexual immorality, the adultery I just mentioned. And then stealing. What are the thefts? So in the book of Revelation, he's saying, the Lord's saying, don't steal, don't do this, don't do that. In the book of Revelation, the very end, it says, let me tell you something, it's going to be so bad. There's going to be so much killing, so much stealing, so much immorality. Let me tell you something. No one's going to repent of that. <laughs> They're not even going to repent of the things that they did because they don't care about me at all. They only care about themselves. Let's go back to Exodus, number 16. There are false witnesses, the next one. Uh, verse 16, you shall not commit adultery. It's 14. 15, you shall not steal. 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Liars. Don't bear false, don't lie. 60% of people, they said, couldn't go 10 minutes without lying. I don't know how that could be. I just read the stat. More people lie on the phone than face to face. Children start lying at the age of two, but they lie convincingly by the age of four. People lie for self protection, personal gain, not wanting to do something. Hey, can you come over here? Can you come over and help me? No, I can't do that. Why? I, I just. Uh, uh, honey, tell them I'm not home. Uh, right? So people lie about everything. We lie to make a good impression. We lie to avoid being around other people. We, we, we lie to protect someone. We lie, we lie, we lie. In Revelation 21 8 says, All liars shall have their part in the of life. All liars. <coughs> tell me we're not sinful then. We're talking about forgiving other people that are sin. We just got to look at ourselves and say, Man, I'm committing. Do you know how many of these I'm committing? Because we steal in so many more ways than we think we're stealing. Okay, and then finally, you shall not cover your neighbor's house, nor cover your neighbor's wife, nor a male servant. Or don't cover, cover anything you're doing. And how many people think, man, I don't have that stuff. 
I wish I had what they had. I don't get any of that. And so the next thing is, uh, after the commandments, which I'm just going to speak one minute on, is the tabernacle. The tabernacle, which would become the temple. You can read about it yourself. That's Exodus 25 to 40. tells us each individual piece. It all had meaning behind it. It says something. It all points to Jesus. Just like I said here, he's the center of all. In the temple, he's the center. He's the holy of holies. He's there. Surrounded by angels. Still there. Next. Back. Yes. Suggestion. If anybody has the opportunity to go down to the Mennonite... Uh, Tabernacle. Yes. Yes. It's excellent. It is good. Let me close with this. Uh, Deuteronomy. If you can close with this quickly. Call your store. Yeah. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter two, because I want to cover numbers. How we're supposed to walk with God next time. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter two, verse one. Or two, two. One. Sorry. One verse two. Is that chapter one? Yeah. Right here. That's it. Okay. Verse two. It's God's will to go through the wilderness, but never God's will to wander. God, we go through wilderness journeys, but it's never God's will to wander. When we get next week to how we're supposed to walk with God in the numbers, it says it is 11 days journey from Horeb to, to Canis Point. It should have taken 11 days. Instead, it's going to take 38 years. And 600,000 people are going to die. 603,000. 550. are going to die because they did not walk with God the way they were supposed to. What should have taken just 11 days, this is what we're going to speak of next week, what should have taken 11 days took 30 years. This is why we have to learn, when we study this next week, when we, see, when we get the numbers next week and see how we're supposed to walk with God, it's going to be a self-examination to us to see if we're living in rebellion against God. Okay? So, Lord willing, see you next week. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Once again, Father, as always, I pray that you might have been pleased with everything said here this morning because it's for your honor and glory that we do these things. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the Lamb of God. Thank you for the blood. Thank you, we can remember this morning. Lord, I just pray that we might walk with you. Help us to, to see you every day. Help us to live by your truth. And then use us, Father, in any way you see fit to glorify yourself. Give us safe traveling mercies now as we go home. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody.